32 centers and uh sorry our small business development center is hosted at chinese mutual aid and uh, we're uh, one of 42 centers throughout the state of illinois because most of the centers are either hosted by chambers of commerce uh, down like in Carbondale or U of I or also at universities, uh, even that include uh, College of DuPage. Um, so we are funded through the SBA, Small Business Administration. They give money to each state. Each state parses their money for Departments of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. You might have heard the acronym DCEO. And a DCEO has several agencies that they oversee, which includes Illinois SBDC. So we're very fortunate at Chinese Mutual Aid, we're the only AAPI SBDC in the state of Illinois. So, uh, and we of course being located in Argyle, or you can also call that North Chicago Chinatown, um, even though we are in the neighborhood and we host all of the clients and uh, connections and organizations that are affiliated work with Chinese Mutual Aid and Chinese Mutual Aid has been uh, now going on 40 years, um, we do welcome all clients of all types of businesses, uh, no matter your background. So one thing as you determine who is a, a good fit for you as a business advisor, the key thing to understand is for us to be business advisors, we need to have, uh, have had business experience, having had owned businesses or currently owned businesses or several businesses, but also uh, have consulted or work with businesses in the past. So some of us have expertise, for example, in construction. Some of us have expertise in consumer products. Some of us have expertise in uh, uh, working overseas or even government contracts. So you'll find that with your business advisor, um, then when they're working with you, uh, you'll get a really good feel, not only on their background and the comfort level you have in communicating with them and also feeling that their background is enough to help you with your business, that also you could look for other business advisors uh, and even within the Chinese Mutual Aid because of the broad background of our fellow advisors, which we'll go over in, in a moment. Um, the other thing about business advisors too is uh, we are able to help any type of business. And we have lots of clients who start from just an idea, we have businesses who've been around for 25 years, and the needs include those from, hey, how do I turn this idea as a, from a side gig to a full-time job someday to uh, uh, more established businesses or larger scale businesses or maybe looking for investors or looking for big loans or looking for types of grants they might qualify for. So we're very fortunate with the support of We Do, our director, Cheta Setia, and uh, of course, uh, the Chinese Mutual Aid, as long as support from the state of Illinois, that we honestly could really either introduce you to the business advisor that's more in line with your needs or with other business advisors in our rotation that probably share different aspects of what you're looking for. So we're very excited to work with you. All right, um, we have, uh, I'm counting seven uh, attendees. So uh, we'll go ahead and start this off. So again, everyone, hi everyone. My name is Edgar Jimenez. I'm a business advisor here with a small business development center hosted by Chinese Mutual Aid. Also with us today, we have We Do. Uh, he supports us um, and is the one uh, producing our seminar today. And of course, we're very, very honored to uh, have Ari uh, Shuzak with us that you will uh, detail on how to uh, create and how to build a great website. So uh, I'll just kick this off and starting. So I'll let uh, we uh, bring up our slide is that um, here at a small business development center, as, uh, as I shared earlier, um, we are one of 42 small business development centers or SBDCs in the state of Illinois. And uh, we're hosted by chambers of commerce or universities, or in this case, a cultural center uh, that uh, is Chinese Mutual Aid. So we're the only AAPI center uh, in the state of Illinois. And uh, we essentially help anyone, any business-minded person from an idea, a concept, maybe have an invention, or maybe you have this business idea. We'll take you all the way from business idea to uh, getting it off the ground, getting you filed with the state, 
getting a business plan and helping you articulate how to turn that idea into a business. And uh, even from some people might do something on the side, how do you turn that side gig into a full-time gig? And we help all kinds of business owners um, that include mid-size, you have a couple employees or even businesses that have a couple million dollars. And that would include maybe needs of getting a business plan or getting a loan or pitching to investors or really how to scale. Um, also, the great thing about the SBDC state of Illinois with the other 42 centers, um, and even within our center, we have a broad range of expertise to be uh, to offer because as a business advisor, you really need to have been a, a business owner to qualify or consulted or uh, been in the business world so we can give that fresh aspect. So you see the slide here that um, uh, our director, Chada Setia, he is um, actually a... Uh, he actually had an Amazon store plus a luggage company for about 25 years, which he had transitioned within the family. And now he's our director. So he's one of our business advisors. And also we have Jin Lee and uh, Mark Tudor. Jin Lee um, being a uh, fluent uh, Korean speaker and also uh, been in Uptown uh, for, for many, many years. He helps all ranges of businesses. And then there's Mark Tudor. Uh, Mark Tudor actually owns several businesses himself, as well as being a business advisor. Uh, Jin Lee has um, uh, some small stores and uh, large restaurants and uh, import-export expertise. And the Mark Tudor, the, one of his companies, uh, they do uh, construction, highway, street repair and construction, as well as he has a, a couple other businesses, import-export, as well as uh, consulting. So, and then, uh, and then for my background, I have a very broad background from consumer products to startups getting funding, business, business uh, plan writing, pitch decks, uh, and a lot of it from ideation to uh, market research, as well as branding. So uh, then the last slide is really kind of a, a bulleted summary of uh, what we do here at SBDC. Uh, the next, and uh, all the way from, we, we and, and here's the thing, this is what we like to say, we are no cost. We're no cost confidential. No cost really means free. You don't pay anything. But we don't say free because you've all, we've all paid for it through our taxes. So that's why we call it no cost, it's confidential. Um, confidential meaning that you're able to share with us because we have a confidential agreement to you as um, with you, as, uh, you being our client and uh, any ideas that you share with us, we don't share with anyone else and we work towards your success. And these things include financial analysis, uh, business planning and training, work, you know, government contracting, et cetera. And if we don't have the expertise in-house here at Chinese Mutual Aid, there are other SBDCs who have different business advisors with different backgrounds uh, that could provide that guidance. So uh, we look forward to next steps if you are looking for business advising, uh, as well as uh, thank you very much for being here today, being part of our educational webinar series that we do um, on a regular basis, either monthly um, not only on our own, but also in uh, association with other organizations, including the National ACE, uh, um, National ACE, and even the city of Chicago. So without more to any delay, I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker, our guest presenter, Ari Shuzak. Um, and she's going to go and teach us how to sell and what really makes for a compelling, uh, successful website. Welcome, Ari. Thank you, Edgar. All right, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Give me just one moment to load that up. Okay. All right, let me know when you guys can see my screen. Yes? yes. Wonderful. Yes. All right, I'm just going to arrange some of my screen right over here. I have like a couple of screens in front of me, so I'm gonna, I want to make sure I can see you guys here. All right, so Edgar, thank you for the introduction uh, for me here and for all of you guys who are just joining here today thank you for spending the time with us today i'm gonna go over made to sell creating website that convert so if you already have a business website this is going to help you really think about like how can you update your website make the tweaks that you need so that you can increase more conversion and at the end of the day, you want more clients, you want more bookings, you want more sales on your website, and we're going to dive deep, dive deeper into this particular information. 
Now, I'm Arik Shoshak. I know my last name is like very hard to pronounce. It's Polish. It took me five years to say it, you guys. I don't have the tongue for it. So you can call me Arik. That is totally cool. I am the CEO and head of strategy at Sekalofia. We are a women-owned web agency here in Chicago. I'm in Evanston. And we primarily work with women-led brands in B2B tech, really creating a platform that can really be leveraged for their success and also for their business growth. So that's our very, very much core services. And some of the things that you guys also see on the screen here are our full range of other services that are complementary to what we do. So you will see brand strategy and development, web solution and e-commerce, which is the core of it. We also do a lot of user experience, interface design, as well as data visualization and infographic design. Okay, moving on to the next slide here. I like to get to know some of my people, right? Especially those who are attending. However, today we're not gonna be able to do any breakout rooms, but that is okay. I'm not entirely sure if we have a chat room though. It seems like we do, but Hui, let me know if people can actually drop information on the chat. Can they? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. fantastic. So if you are okay with this, everyone, please feel free to share a little bit about who you are, maybe a little bit about your business so others can learn about you. And also perhaps answer one of the cue card that you have in front of you. There are four very interesting questions over there. There are card one, card two, card four, and also the card three that I'm apparently missing. Now, just for fun, since we have Hui and also Edgar over here, any of you want to answer any of the card, Edgar or Hui? Just kind of like, you know, get a little wow. bit social here. All right. Hey, I'm proud of my uh, Mexican Filipino heritage. So I'm a Mexipino. But the weirdest food I've ever had is Filipino, and it is a 14-day-old um, uh, uh, boiled duck egg called balut. And uh, oh, when you that. eat it, it actually has little feathers in the beak. But uh, when you open it up, you drink the, uh, we'll call it the juice, as well as eat parts of it. So it's uh, not necessarily a tradition. It's kind of, and you might have seen this uh, food as a deer food on the internet. But it's actually very interesting, but as by far the weirdest food I've had, balut, B-A-L-U-T. And if you ever want to do that for uh, a dare for a party, I definitely recommend uh, visit your local Filipino shop and see if they have balut. Oh, man. Would you try it again, though? <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. As a, <laughs> for a dare. For a dare. Yeah. Okay, cool. Kui, is there any card you want to choose and answer? I would choose the... Um... Card number two, okay. would you rather give up your smartphone or your computer? I would say about my computer, because, uh, you know, like smartphone would be, be, be with me like about 24 seven. I can bring my smartphone to uh, everywhere yeah. that I go to, but I cannot bring the computer. And then like for the smartphone, you have like the 5G, the cellular, you can access to like the uh, to the Wi-Fi anywhere, but uh, you cannot mm -hmm. do it with a computer. So yeah. I would rather choose a smartphone or a computer. Oh man, I actually would choose the opposite. I cannot live without my laptop. It's like <laughs> I have to have my laptop. But anyway, thank you for playing with me here. Um, next up, as I scroll to the next slide over here, I want us to really think about this, right? We often feel really confident whenever we want to buy specific items. In our head, we already decided like, I'm going to buy X, right? Or I'm going to get this. Despite of having to pay premium pricing for it, right? No matter the cost, you already have it in your mind. It's like, I need this. But if we flip this a little bit to ourselves, if we have our own business and to our consumer, right? How come our customers don't have the same confidence when it comes to our website, when we maybe offer our services or even offer our products? So. Why is it that we feel confident when we shop, but our customers don't really have that same level of confidence just yet? So what are we missing, you guys? There's got to be something that is missing. There's got to be a gap here. What part of your website that currently doesn't communicate those information, right? So here's the problem. Most of the time, right, we did not pay close attention to the user-centric experience. And that is the UX part. That's the user journey, that is the user flow that isn't really fully communicated well on your current website. 
So this is really a big thing because then it's about, you know, choosing you or choosing your competitor. Obviously, you want your customers to choose you. So how can we fix this on your website? I would say you can leverage user experience and specifically on one tool that's called user journey. How many of you actually have heard of this? If you have heard of it or even like have implemented on your current website, or maybe even some other people have mentioned it to you, feel free to share that in the chat. And for those who actually don't know about this in details, we're also going to be you know, talking more about it. I'll show you some examples. And I'm also going to show you how you can create your own user journey for your website. Now with user journey though, what you'll be able to do is to really bridge the gap between your users and your brand online, all right? And really try to 2X this conversion that you long for on your website. Okay, this is how it typically would look like. If you search on Google, you'll come up from, you know, an examples from NNG, dot com or NNG, actually nngroup.com. Um, so that's the typical diagram that you would see. You'll notice that there are three separate zones. On the very top, they call it the lens. On the second zone, it's called the experience. And then the zone C, uh, C over here, it's called the insights. Now it's typical to really just trying to figure out my target audience, right? Whoever it is that you're targeting, what are their scenarios? What are their goals and expectations? And then how do you want to move them throughout this journey, right? What should they be experiencing when they get to know you, get to know your information on the website and all the experiences that you want to guide them on the website, as well as what are some of the key opportunities that you can introduce to them? Maybe some of the opportunities is that, hey, get on my mailing list so that you can get 10% discount or maybe something else, right? What are these different key insights or even like opportunities that you can slowly introduce to them throughout the journey with you and your brand, as well as through the website. So what exactly is user journey? User journey is a visual trip, right? It's really a visual trip from point A to point B, from the moment that they maybe heard about you, they found out about you maybe on social media, or maybe their friends telling them about you and your website, and they finally experiencing and landing on your website. So that is the user journey, right? It's a visual trip from the user across the different solution that you have. Now, some other people would say like, what if I have multiple target audience, right? Would I be creating multiple user journey? And the answer is yes. Because typically, if you have a few different target audience, the way they would experience your website, as well as your maybe product or even services might be slightly different. You can tweak and see which one makes the most sense for each and individual target users or persona, right? And then adapt these experiences for them. So for example, let's think of it this way. If you have a business that cater to an elderly as well as a teenager, right? This is like an imaginary business, but if you have these two separate persona, you would create two separate user flows, one for the el elderly persona and then one for the teenager persona. The way they would interact with your business, especially on your website, would look completely different. Perhaps the elderly would find, will find out about you and your business through Googling, right? Or maybe they heard from their peers. Now, for the teenager side of things, the persona for teenagers, they might find out about you from TikTok, right? So the access from them beginning journey is already different. Now, how do you move them from that beginning journey all the way to conversion? Those are going to look quite different from each of the individual persona. All right. So what do we need to do first? There are three steps, but the step number one is to really understand your audience. I hear it all the time. People would tell me like, I know my audience, Ari. They are these, you know, women age 15 to 65 and they live in, you know, USA. It's like, well, that is great that you know that at least, you know, your target audience are women, primarily or female, right? But that is still super broad. How do we become a little bit more niche and be a bit more details about our target audience so that you can really target a very specific group for your target audience. So some of the questions that you would want to ask, not just 
who they are. You probably already know them. But where do they live or hang out? Are they really living in the city or are they actually living in suburban, right? Or maybe they live in a hybrid city. I mean, I live here in Evanston. It's not really a city. It's not really a suburb, right? So it's kind of like a mix. So perhaps there are more insights to like, where do they live or where do they hang out? And then the next question that you might want to think about as well is that what are their behavior? What do they thinking look like? Some of us, we probably are very specific in the ways of our behavior as well as the way we're thinking. For me, I love to just like find out about information through online, right? Whereas my husband, he would just look for the recommendation through Yelp or things like that. There is this very specific way of us trying to find information. For your target audience, it might be the same way. Are they relying on references from their network? Are they relying from you know, reviews they maybe read on maybe like Google My Business, right? Or maybe they just rely on just the reviews on a website. What is it that makes them feel confident knowing exactly like if other people says that this is a good brand, I know that this is a good brand, right? What uh, influences that decision? Ari, Ari yeah. if, uh, if I could, what about, um, you know, AI is hot and we all need to become AI users, obviously in the next six months to survive business-wise. <laughs> quote unquote, um, anything you suggest along the lines of figuring out who your audience is? There's different types of posts out there, but any yeah. guidance on maybe how AI can help each of us best identify our best target opportunities or our customers? That's a good question, Edgar. Okay, you might not like this uh, answer from me. Honestly, talk to human, right? Talk to your own customer. But if there are some issues with you talking to your target customers, especially Let's just say that you're just starting out, right? You're just starting out your business. You do not have a client base. You do not have them. So what do you do? You could leverage AI and trying to figure out like, okay, this is my business. This is the information of my, at least my target audience that I want to target, right? Does this make sense? So typically you might be able to get some information on that, but I won't really... 100% relying on just what AI would spit out to you because again, you're the one who knows your business and you still need to learn from the real human being who will be your customers, right? Now, for those of you who are at least already in, let's say two or you know three years of business or even more, you probably already have your customer base. You can talk to them. You don't have to talk to all of them, but you can create like a small sample, right? Think of it five to eight people, perhaps, right? And then really just trying to understand like, hey, I really want to get to know you better so that we can serve more of our target audience better in the future, right? For those of you who truly believe in what you do, especially your product and your services, they would be more than happy to share their insights with you. Take them to lunch, or maybe you have a small gathering together for your brand where you can invite these customers or your client and really just have a conversation. That's how I do it. And I gain lots of insights just from really just be honest and be vulnerable with your target audience so that you can understand what their needs are. Ari, right, let me lean into that for a sec, uh, because I was a market research analyst at a Unilever had a, it was a $200 million brand. But believe it or not, even though it was a big brand, uh, it was very important to get focus groups, as I already just explained, yeah. about eight people. But uh, in, in this case, the, the the caveat with that is two things. You know, get people who don't feel they need to be nice, you know, people that could be kind of blunt and candid. That's why when you do big focus group, you get strangers together and you're not the one standing in front. So it doesn't the information you get is, you know, objective. Also, number two, just do also remember it is eight people, uh, you know, a small group that don't say just because eight people like your idea, it doesn't mean 100% of all your customers are going to like it. Just, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt, but also use your own experience, you know, either your years of uh, selling a certain product or decades of service, or maybe your family has been in a certain industry for many, many years. I would say take that as a guide. But yeah, actually getting a group of a focus group of update people is incredibly professional and uh, the big companies do that. So it's great, great advice, Ari. So thanks. One thing that I would also lean into what you just said, Edgar, don't take everything personal. Sometimes it's it's not about you. It's about the business, right? Yes, you are part of the business. You are the founder. You are the owner. 
but really they are trying to speak up for your own benefits too. So if they say that this is not working out for them, figure out how can you potentially make it better for them, right? Maybe to change their mind. Um, but if a lot of people are thinking that, okay, there's something here, but it's not fully executed well. So you know where to improve on. So finding people that can really be candid, just like what Edgar mentioned earlier, those are key because you don't want people to just like, you know, lie to you just because they want to protect your feelings. So yeah, I completely agree with that. Now for the remaining two of the questions that I have here, where are they in their life right now? To me, this is really important. Because again, if you have such a wide range of age that you're trying to target, you may not know exactly where your product or your customers is going to fit in their life. Think of it this way. If you're in a wedding industry, right, and you're targeting um, couples who are in their 60s versus those who are in their, you know, late 20s, the experience that these couples are trying to create for their wedding are going to be exactly different right? They're not going to be the same at all because they are in completely different stage. The one who are in their 60, they maybe already have divorced um, previously, or maybe they have lost their spouse previously. So the way they want to bring yet another wedding might look completely different versus the ones, you know, in their late twenties, they're like super excited, madly in love. And they just want, I feel like the best of everything. So there's a very critical you know, indication here for you to understand, like, where are these people, you know, in their life right now? Think about like people who may be currently planning to have family versus those who, you know, just um, perhaps got um, fired from their company, right? So what are some of these different occasions that happening in their life and the milestones that currently they're experiencing in their life? And how come your product and services come at the right time? Now, the last one here, their deciding factor. You know, when you sometimes want to buy something, you're trying to still think about like, which one should I get? This left one or this right one, right? What is that one particular, I guess, like, you know, deciding factor that you're still asking yourself, do I pay more or do I pay less? Is this convenient for me or is it not? Is it going to be faster or is it going to be slower, right? Think about what are the deciding factors that your target audience are thinking. Is it because you guys are the fastest one to deliver whatever service, right? Or you guys are the most convenient, let's just say meal kit in Chicagoland area, whatever that might be. Find out what is that deciding factor so that when the moment they see your offering on the website, it makes sense for them and they know exactly this is what I need. Okay. Pro tip in here. I've seen a lot of people doing this, right? They would just create persona just for the sake of creating persona. Don't do that. You do want to take the time to understand your customer audience or, you know, persona, however you want to say it really well, because you are investing in them as much as they will be investing in you. And also remember, business sole purpose is to create customers. Without customers, you technically don't have a business, right? Okay, so that's my pro tip over here. Now, step number two is aligning it with their needs. Now that you know their needs, right? What else can we do? How do we align what we have, our products, our services with their exact need? So ask yourself these following questions, right? How does your service or product solve your current target audience need? Again, is it because it's the cheapest? Is it the fastest? Is it the most convenient? What are those, right? Think about it. And then what is your unique selling proposition? Do you have an USP? Are you differentiate and you're differentiating yourself from other competitors in your market, right? What are they? And then third one, where would they go or talk to before they get to you? Is it their friends? Is it Google? Is it Yelp? Is it Google My Business? There's so many different avenues out there. And this in particular will really help you narrow down where you'll be investing your marketing money, right? You cannot be investing in way too many different channels because you don't know which one works. But if you know exactly where your target audience is going to find you, 
and rely on that particular platform to find you, you'll be investing your marketing money very strategically that will you know, give you a return in value. Ari, um, so uh, yeah. when I started a business back in the day, uh, my first one, um, one thing that I felt our product at the time, it was a Velcro powered glove and gear holder. It's Velcro holds gloves for golfers. But we said, oh, golfers have gloves. What about construction? Oh, okay, construction. What about people who play baseball and football? So we were of the mind that this is such a good idea. So many sports or or even construction workers could use this. But then yeah. the danger of being an individual business is that I dilute the message with so many and I'm hoping someone buys my product. So mm -hmm. what's your advice in um, helping people figure out who that decision maker and how to get to that person rather than shotgun versus it very targeted? What would you say is a good way to optimize that as quickly as possible without burning through too much time or too much money or you know investment dollars? Very simple. Be niche right? That is the number one recommendation that I would share. And here's the thing. I've experienced that too when I started my business. So I'm just like a lot of other, I guess like generic business owners back then because I want to target everybody. My mentor did tell me, Ari, don't target everybody, target very specific people. I didn't listen until my fifth year of business. And I'm telling you guys, if you're still in your very early days, be as niche as, as possible and be very strategic with your messaging and target that one group of customers. Because when you already have a really good and strong customer base, it's much easier to expand and target other target audience or other maybe like industry or verticals, right? Because you already have a strong customer base. But if you don't have that yet and you want to like, oh, you know what? We can actually offer the same thing for completely different target audience. Like, again, you're going to dilute your messaging and even more so you're going to spend a lot more money to invest on all of your marketing channels. If you have those funds, Honestly, go for it, but I wouldn't recommend it because you want to be strategic in your approach. So be niche in the beginning. Once you really hone in your messaging and also your you know, core services or products, as well as your customer base, then you can branch out. And you finally will have you know, a clear idea in terms of like, how can we replicate this success to this different vertical, to this different target audience? Because you already have a strong guideline and process for that. Absolutely, Ari. And one thing too, just to share everyone, that's where your market research comes in, especially let's say your family has experience or you, you've been working in a certain job for many, many years, or you and your friends uh, want to start something. It's that research, because that research, you'll then determine where's the biggest opportunity, where's the most need for your service or your solution. And that'll save a lot of time. Because truly, um, it's like the term you heard, the shiny penny. It's great to chase many, many opportunities, different industries, different people, different networks. But, you know, remember, time is money and there's only one of you, especially when you're starting out. Be very targeted, but you save all that grief and time and unnecessary investment by doing your research um, and, uh, and, and objective research, talking to people who use a product or even, you know, publications that are out there to give you some guidance. So, but thanks, Ari. Anytime. All right. So I think we talked a little bit about this earlier already, but remember, revisit your persona again, right? Take a look at their behavior and thinking in particular so that you can make the best decision for investing your marketing dollars. Okay. Next slide here. The step number three is designing the experience. This is where the fun part begins, right? Yes, you did your market research already. You understand your target audience. Fantastic. Now, how do you deliver all these different experience for them? So there are a couple of things here. There are channels and touch points, and these are going to be areas where you'll be exploring some of the different channels and touch points where you will deliver the experiences for your target customers. So what are the difference, right? People get confused sometimes on both of these different terms. So I'll, I'll explain it to you guys. Channels are essentially a way for you to understand where customers are coming from, right? Or how they will interact with you, your brand, your company, your business. Where are, whereas the touch points, they are a bit more specific and they're more precise. So let's take an example here. Online is a channel, right? And then 
online chat could be a touch point. Website can be your channel and then any particular element in your website that will be a touch point so i'll give you more examples here so you guys can actually see the differences on different areas whether it's on a website social media or even search engine so website social media and search engine are the channels whereas items below them or under or inside these particular channels are your touch points so thinking if you have a website and you're using this as your one source of channel your homepage your sales funnels page your contact page even web chat window and any you know content pop up those could be a touch point for you now looking at social media in particular Think of it, um, you know, your carousel, your post, your stories, your live. Those are the um, touch points that you can leverage. Now, looking at search engine here, think of your YouTube videos. Maybe you made them. Maybe your case studies, as well as, you know, articles that you have, or even press and any media mention that you have done in the past for you or even for your business. Okay, so examples on what the user journey typically would look like, it could look like this, right? There is no right or wrong way in creating a user journey as long as you account for a few different areas like the three zones that you saw earlier. So it needs to have a scenario, right? It needs to have a goal. It needs to have this experience map in terms of like how you guide them. And also you need to account for like some touch points, some channels, as well as user actions. You can even add in terms of, I guess, metrics wise, if I go to the next slide here. Okay, over here, you can even make it a little bit more details to include metrics. So how are you gonna track engagement for this particular um, experience, right? Maybe the moment that they come to your website, it needs to have maybe X amount of click to a specific page. How are you planning to measure them? You can add those in your user journey, or you can add you know, all the other critical metrics that you see will be a good fit for you and for your business. Now, there's also a simple one like this that you might see on online as well. Again, there is no right or, or wrong way to do it. What I will actually challenge you guys to do because perhaps, man, REDs look so complicated. I don't even know where to start. I'll challenge you to do something super simple. So this is the one page user journey that I created a couple of years ago that has really helped a lot of people just to get started on their user journey, right? Again, you have three areas over here that you can take a look at on the very top section. You will have your user scenario, their goals and expectation. On the second, I guess like row over there. No, wait. Yeah, row. <laughs> second row, you'll have their emotions and responses to the experience on your website. And then on the last row, you'll have areas of opportunities where you can address your audience pain point. So it can be very simple to look at and you know what your um, you know, cap uh, capabilities for either your business, the products that you have, the services that you have, and how that would help your target audience achieve it on your website. Okay. Uh, pro tip over here is that really thinking about places where your audience actually hang out, right? When I say hang out, it doesn't mean that, okay, are you which restaurant are they going to or whatnot? I mean, you could find those information, but it's more about like on the digital, um, I guess like real estate, right? Where are they hanging out? Are they always on their phone checking out the next um, location on Yelp? Are they on, you know, on their phone always to check out Referral, referrals from other people, or is it through perhaps Reddit, right? There are just so many different sources out there. So the more you talk to your target audience and find out how they find that information, especially for their needs that tie into your business, the better, because then you can tailor these messages and you can maybe think about doing ads on those particular channels. Okay, so let's recap this. There are three steps, right? The first one is your target audience. And then the second one is your alignment. And then the number three is the experience design. So we can certainly share the downloadables for the user journey here. And I can have, you know, the team as SVDC and um, Chinese Mutual Aid to share that with you guys. And you can have it after this session. Okay, so some actionable steps that I would love to share here as well with you, because knowing some of you who already have a business website, 
these five questions would be very helpful for you to start thinking, how can you tweak your website so that you can gain more conversion? Number one, what is your website about? You know how frustrating it is, right? When you go to a website and then you keep scrolling, you keep scrolling, but you don't know anything about this website. Isn't that frustrating? I had that happen many, many times. So make sure that when you have your website, put your users thought um, you know, in your shoes right now. Think of it as you go through your website. Does this website really tell your user what is your business all about? Number two, how does it work? Yes, a lot of people probably already know how, you know, subscription works or even meal kit works or anything else, right? But you have your own process. When you don't communicate your process, it makes your target users questioning it. So before they question it, present that information. It's much easier to just like present, hey, this is how we work, or this is how our process typically look like. That gives them a lot more confidence in you and also in themselves in case they want to pursue your brand or in case they want to buy from you or in case they want to actually hire you. Number three, can I trust this brand? also really important, right? If you have any testimonials, please add that in. If you have any organization that you are associated with, add that in. And even more so if you have certification or maybe you have press as well that you can include, add those in because these are, you know, the more familiar organization or even like maybe um, you know, the five-star reviews that really convince people or maybe help them build the trust that they need for you. Now, the fourth one over here, once they're hooked, once you have all the number one, number two, number three, all checked, they are hooked. What do they need to do? Make sure that your call to action is very clear and it is really easy for them to find. Sometimes I see websites that has some call to actions, but it get buried somewhere or I overlooked it. Make sure it's clear for them to find it. And also, um, you know, it's definitely easy to understand. And then what's next, right? Once your target audience or your customers or even users come to your website and click on that CTA, what happened? Interaction doesn't just stop when you already put a call to action, right? It needs to go somewhere. It needs to do the next step. What are those next steps? So make sure that you think through what the next steps will be after they hit that button, after they click on that, maybe sign up now or something, right? So make sure that you think through all these different interactions um, when you have the page up. Okay. Next part here is all about just like reminding everybody that your website is not one and done. Your website is always going to evolve with you, with your business. So these three areas, optimize, test, and analyze is really going to, to be very helpful for you down the road. So if you want, you can always take, you know, quarterly check-in or six month check-in, or perhaps if it's not being used too much, right? If you're not relying too much on your website to get your traffic and not, um, you can always do annual review to, you know, optimize it, to test and as well as analyzing it. Okay. I have some examples here, but I want to make sure that we have enough time for either any questions or Edgar, if there's anything else that you wanted to ask as well, uh, feel free to do that. The rest of these information are some examples. I can go through them pretty quickly if you want me to, or we can answer some questions. Yeah, so far uh, we've had a pretty good sharing. We've gotten a few questions. Um, so, uh, it, it seems like we're getting some very good responses. Uh, I did have a one question though, just a thought starter for everyone on the prior slide. If you could go back one slide, Ari, just for people's references. So, um, as you talk about building traffic and of course there's testing and analyzing in general, what, what's a philosophy that people should take in building traffic, meaning that service building service traffic is different than building, you know, uh, product traffic versus online sales traffic versus, hey, come to my car wash traffic. Any high level guidance um, to our broad range of business owners that we have here today? Yeah, definitely. When it comes to like traffic, right? What you really want to think about is where your traffic going to come, to come from, essentially. So for some business, 
they might not rely on people searching them online. They just don't have to. So they might not, you know, invest in SEO. They might not invest a lot in Google ads because it doesn't make sense. Now, for some other brands, when it comes to think of it like direct to consumers, right? They rely heavily on people searching their products online. So they would invest a lot in Google ads um, or even like other type of ads from, let's say, Instagram or even you now Facebook. So the key here really is to try to understand like where would your user search for you, right? Take my business, for example. We don't really spend a lot of ads on Facebook or Google or even, you know, heavily um, push investment on SEO because people just don't search for us. But we will meet these people at networking events, at conferences, at, you know, accelerator program, things like that. So understanding like where your traffic will be coming from is key. And even more so, like knowing exactly where your target audience will find out information to find a reliable source that they need, right? So for, let's see, Another example for restaurants, right? One um, one time ago, we have a restaurant client and they also asked us the same question. And for them in particular, they very much heavily rely on information from Google, right? Google My Business. You search different restaurants on Google as well as Yelp. So thinking through like the typical source of traffic, either for your particular industry or your particular type of business, you can start from there. I would try to validate that though from asking it by, you know, doing the market research that we already talked about earlier to make sure that is this really the right place for us? Because while the industry that you're in or maybe other competitors are doing exactly the typical thing, it might not entirely work for you. So there's always going to be that, you know, one odd things. Maybe your business is slightly different in the way you approach it, or maybe slightly, you know, different in terms of like how you would want to market it to set the differentiator. It's going to, again, back to where do you want to go as well as like who your target audience and where they're finding this information. One thing I, 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 a bit. Ari, I totally agree with you. One thing I want to lean into also for everyone on here is to consider analog. That's a fancy way of saying paper or even signage. So I had a client, uh, this guy is a personal trainer. He's an instructor, Muay Thai. And he had been in business for, for about three years. He had individual clients. These are lawyers or stock traders, very affluent. But he built it one-in-one -one training. But when he decided to open up his small gym in Ravenswood on the north side, he put up a sign, an, a, a neon sign in his window. Um, and in fact, about 50% of his new clients that came in because he went from a one-on-one -on -one model to a group model came from the neighborhood because they were looking for a workout place in the neighborhood. So the, the point, is, and, and by the way, he also does a lot of social media and Google. He doesn't, hasn't paid for ads in a year. He's a really compelling um, content, but um, don't, don't, be, don't feel you're above hanging, putting door hangers on the local homes or businesses in the area. Uh, don't, hold back from putting on little posters at the Starbucks or the signage you have, even though restaurants, all restaurants have signs, but maybe your business, maybe your location is unique that put up a sign that draws people's attention. So really what it comes down to be as creative as you need to be and your messaging to differentiate yourself really helps you break through the clutter as it's called and really get into those customers that your competitors do not. So think outside the box. Uh, but really, in the end, it's like what type of people you're looking for and how do you want to reach them? Be creative, but sometimes the basic things like this, uh, basic analog signage, paper, you know, and, and even people meeting people face to face is sometimes the most effective, most profitable way to get your customers. Agreed. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, we can go towards the examples over here. I have bad UX example and good UX example, so we can kind of compare and take a look at it together. So for this one, why is it a bad example, Ari? A lot of people would ask me this because it looks like a really good design. So the challenge with this particular example is that there are three content sliders or carousel in one page. Yes, you can use content sliders, of course, 
but try not to overuse them. Anything that's being overused in one page is always a bad UX experience, right? Because you don't want to deliver those repeated um, experience in one page. And this one in particular for content sliders, think of it this way. It's a content slider. You're asking the user to click. And you keep asking them to click, 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 and click just to find information. That is such a bad UX um, experience because they just want to find out more quick info. You're asking them to do a lot more work than they have to. So that's why it is a bad UX example. Um, next one over here is yet another one. I like things moving on a website. I think we all do. We like some sort of interaction or even like micro animation, things like that. But this is honestly very much overwhelming, right? Not just because the text is moving so fast, but also there are two of them. Think of it this way. If you're trying to pay close attention on which information you need to read, it's going to be super overwhelming for your brain trying to keep up. It's like, which one am I reading? Which one should I be focusing on so that I can really absorb the information? Now, if you really want to use a moving text, certainly you can, but do it a little bit more intentionally. So this one in particular, they do it really subtly, right? So it's very slow, well, not super slow, slow enough that it is moving nicely and it's also pretty big in size so that you don't have to like really lean in to read it. Um, but also it's just simply subtle with the overall design team that they have chosen. Another bad UX example here, you want to build trust. And typically I would see a lot of these, um, you know, bad practice, putting all of your, you know, familiar logos or certification, or even maybe the organization that you're part of and press logos near the bottom of your homepage or even the bottom of your landing page, sales page, whichever. Don't do that. You want to build up the credibility and the trust all the way at the top at the very beginning. So if you're going to do something like this, make sure you do something similar to what this particular example here is doing. You'll notice that right after the hero over here, they have great list of you know credibility building, right? They have, hey, this is where we got featured and this is how many people that has been raving about our product. And this is our, you know, um, I think this is their like doing good um, or give back initiative. So you can highlight a lot of these information right at the top after your hero. Okay, Aria, I mean, Aria, if I yeah. can ask, I'm sorry. At the beginning, you talk about um, one of the lessons you learned is to not build a persona. You know, don't pursue building a persona at least right away. Uh, one question that, that did come up is, um, you know, where can you build or when should you or how do you or when can you build a persona for a customer? When? Or, yeah, when or how, because in this case, it's a balance between the brand and a persona of your brand mm -hmm. or, for, or for targeting a customer. Any guidance that uh, that you can share from your learning and experience concerning personas, the, yes. the why you should and why you shouldn't. Okay, um, let me trace back here. I believe the pro tip that I shared earlier is about don't create persona just for the sake of creating a persona, right? But when should you create a persona? I would say immediately after you think about building a business, that is key. Because if you're building a business and you don't know who you're targeting, you're not going anywhere. You're going to be doing a lot of different things and you're not sure who you're really targeting. You're wasting money, you're wasting resources. And even more so, you're not going to be able to help the right people. So what do you do, right? So when you want to really target one particular customer, think about like, if I can imagine this person, what would their life look like? Who are they, right? Because in your first one or maybe second year of business, you might not entirely know all the details that you need to know about these customers. But if you can imagine like who would be the right person that might be interested in your product and service, as well as get impacted by these product or services. Now that is your start, right? You will learn and you will grow and you will find out more information about this persona as you keep building it because things will change. You'll find out like, oh, they actually don't live in a city. They live in a suburb. Or maybe you'll find out they actually are not in their mid thirties. They're actually in their late forties. So you'll continue to evolve this um, information about your 
persona, but you still need to start somewhere and start with like really thinking through like if this were somebody else, right? And put your shoes, who would be the right person that can benefit the most from your service as well as from your, or maybe your product? All right. Okay. I think that's it. So if you guys still have more questions, please do reach out. I'm yeah. here in Evanston, or you can reach me on LinkedIn. There's an open question, uh, um, Ari, is uh, about the deck. This deck is uh, this shareable. I know it's a PDF that we've gotten here. Uh, I just uh, leave it as an open question to you if this is something you'd be able to share with um, yeah. the, the audience here. I believe so. Yeah. You guys can okay. certainly get it. Okay. All right. And, Thank you. Uh, thank yeah, you for anytime. that, Ari. Sure. Um, and I know we have a few minutes here. Uh, we're opening up to any other questions uh, all of our attendees may have. Um, you know, one question that did come up, and Ari, we talked about this at the very beginning, but to share with everyone, people might have questions. What platform is the best? You know, uh, WordPress or Wix or Foursquare? Uh, what's your simple or you know, straightforward advice you have for everyone here? Yes. Gosh, talking about tech and platforms, they are endless. There are so many different ones out there, new ones coming up every single day. Uh, here's the thing. When it comes to technology, and I get backed up on this by my partner, my business partner as well, who's a you know, master in computer science. Even he told me, like, you know, the tools doesn't really matter. The platform doesn't really matter. What matter is, is that you start with the right strategy. Before building a website, right? Think about like, okay, what is this website going to be for? How are you going to manage it? How is it going to grow with you? Because then once you have these information, once you know the details, you'll be able to pick and choose like, actually, maybe WordPress is not the right fit for this. This is not what I need. I need Shopify, right? So thinking through like before you choose any website platform, think about how are you going to use it? What is the purpose for this website? And how is it going to be able to grow with you? Because on some cases, there are clients that we have in the past and they started out with, I believe it was Wix or maybe Squarespace. And you know that these platforms, they don't have a lot of, um, customization freedom, right? You can't really like hack your way in trying to like mold it into something that you want very specific. It is a platform with a specific template for a reason. So if you want something that is fully custom or needed to mold into your own vision for something super specific, then you would probably want to go with WordPress. And, you know, just really thinking through like capabilities of each and individual platform is very important because please don't ask in Facebook groups like, hey, which one is the best for building a website? I cringe every single time I see that questions on a Facebook group because it's clear that this particular business owner has not done their research, have not really done their strategy work to really figure out what will be the best fit for their business. You know, I got a question here about is there a checklist of what to do on a website, especially for those who are beginners? To your point, you have to have big picture. You don't have yeah. a lot of time. I'll use uh, WordPress. If I have a big budget, I'll do custom. Yeah. But hey, I want something simple. I use Wix. But any any uh, guidance on a checklist that yeah. people could use as a beginner uh, to really to your point on determining what website or layout, etc., to use when they're trying yeah. to figure out how to build. This question comes in at the right time for this slide. To be honest, so. You guys, I've done this for the past 13 years, and a lot of these questions, we heard it all the time, right? And that is one of the big reasons why my partner and I wrote this book, Made to Sell, Creating Websites That Convert, because it really, okay, number one, this web, not <laughs> this book is not about teaching you how to, you know, make a website in terms of like coding and stuff like that. It's not that. It's more about strategically thinking about how do you convey your messaging, your business, and then translating your business ideas into digital experiences on the web, right? So all the questions that you ask about this in terms of like, hit a checklist, any other beginner questions about website building for a business, this is the book that will tell you about that. 
Great. And and uh, available on uh, not only guidance from your website, but also uh, this book's available on Amazon. No, th yes. thank you. Thank you so much, Ari. Um, and one thing just for everyone here and those who have already left, um, uh, thank you for Ari for not only your time today, but also sharing this deck, which uh, we will be able to uh, send out to everyone. But, uh, you know, everyone, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ari. Thank you so much for being here and uh, really helping everyone grow their business. And also, I'd say that the key thing here is um, get out there and take a swing or go for it and really try it out. Because in the end, right, you know, failing is learning. And, uh, you know, if you could manage smaller failures, the better. But uh, you really got to try things. And sometimes when you uh, are out there trying to get your business off the ground or get this idea or service or providing, uh, you know, help to people uh, for business or, or for product, you know, really, uh, you can make a really big difference in people's lives. So every great journey starts with a step. So uh, I want to thank you very much, Ari, if you have any closing words for everyone. No, thank you guys for having me today. And to be honest, excuse me, give me one second. I just recovered from very bad cold, you guys. Um, in terms of like website and the business, like what Edgar mentioned earlier, right? Start somewhere and even more so experiment with it. You're always going to learn about new things for your business and about your customers. And there might be pivot along the way too. And don't be afraid of doing the pivot. If that is the best approach for you and the business and the customers, you are on the right track. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, everyone, for being here. We thank you very much for producing and coordinating this and uh, and getting everyone here to attend today. But uh, look forward to any other webinars that we may have out there. And certainly good luck in your ventures and uh, have a great week. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye.